First things first, in his fifth NBA season, C.J. McCollum averaged over 21 points a game, helping the Blazers win 49 games, clinch the third seed in the Western Conference. And lucky us, he now joins the show. Hey, C.J., how What's are up, you? Man? Good how you to see doing? you. Guys how are you? Welcome. Welcome. Good. Welcome. Good. Good. Good to see you guys. You guys surprised a lot of people this year, where you finished in the West, how you played down the stretch, all of it. When you look back on your season, I'm sure you're not, you didn't end up where you wanted to be, but do you consider it a success for how well the team played together? I thought the regular season was definitely a success, you know, based on what we accomplished, you know, finishing third in the West, uh, clinching the division title uh, once again for, I think, the second time in my five years. But obviously, we didn't finish the way we wanted to in the playoffs. There's a lot of things we wanted to accomplish. We felt like we want to take a step forward and you know, getting swept against the Pelicans wasn't, you know, ideal for us. There, there are these, one of the reasons the NBA playoffs are so great is there are these moments that, I mean, we, we're now talking about the Cavs in a certain way. Mm -hmm. If LeBron gets called for a goaltend and then doesn't hit that shot, we might be talking about something totally different. Exactly. I, I, not to bring up a bad part of your season, but do you think back to game one of that series, the end of that game? If people don't know, that was the close game against mm -hmm. the Pelicans. Game one, you guys had an opportunity to win it. Do you feel like if that game goes differently, that maybe everything's different in that series and for your guys' season? Absolutely. I mean, after... You know, you get swept in the playoffs, you kind of look back and, and try to figure out what you could have done better as an individual. And, you know, I think in game one, I had a turnover down the stretch. It was, it was a one possession game, a uh, turnover with about 40 seconds left in the game, essentially a chance for us to get a two for one. I turned the ball over and, you know, obviously we ended up losing by, I don't know, four or five points, but it was a one possession game. Game two was also, a, it was, we were down two with about, I don't know, 130, 145 left in the game. So losing a home court is never what you want to do, you know, in a playoff series. Obviously Toronto's going through that now, but... And we felt like they, they, they came in our house and, and drank our orange juice, basically. <laughs> <laughs> you and I talked bef be before we went on air about how the playoffs is so magnified. Right. And even though you had tremendous successes during the regular season, because you didn't finish the way you wanted to, people would tend to maybe talk about all the, all, that all the time. I want to talk about you personally, playing with Damian Lillard, what it means to you, what you've learned from him, right. and what do you need to work on? to take your game to the next level, looking forward to next year's basketball season? Oh, that's a great question. I've learned a lot from Dame just you know, over the course of my career, even when I wasn't playing, being able to watch his approach to practice every day, being able to you know, get a better understanding of what type of work you have to put in you know, to have success at the NBA level. And you know, we're great friends. We've been friends since before I was drafted, work out together, spend time together in the summertime, occasionally take vacations together and things of that nature. So we have a very good relationship. But in terms of what I need to work on, I need to work on everything, understanding the game a lot better, uh, pace, defensively figuring out ways to, to not get hit by screens, especially on the ball. There's so many pick and rolls. You know, a lot of two guards are able to play on the ball and off the ball. Now you look at the Bradley Bills, even the Clay Thompsons of the world. A lot of movement stuff. So just figuring that stuff out uh, defensively and then offensively, continuing to take steps forward, finishing better in the paint, being, uh, being better for our team in transition. I think we were bottom five in transition points. All right, CJ, let's move on and talk about the team that beat you guys, the Pelicans. They're now facing the Warriors. They're down 2-0 to the Warriors. Steph Curry returned to the lineup in game two. He scored 28 points, making five of ten three-pointers like he was never even gone. <laughs> what do you think, CJ? What do the Pelicans have to do to have a chance at beating the Warriors tonight? I think they competed well in game two. Um, they, they basically matched them blow for blow. They got out in transition. They were effective. Uh, AD impacted the game. Obviously, Rondo and Drew Holiday impacted the game. But I think it's the, it's a game of runs, and the Warriors, you know, one or two runs a game kind of separates them from their opponent. And I think that third quarter was big. You know, down the stretch of that third quarter, yeah. getting at a fourth, uh, they have to prevent those runs. They have to, I think offensively choosing when to run in transition. I think Shaq and them talked about it a little bit post game, but you don't want to run every possession with them. You just pick and choose your moments, pick and choose your times, and then from a defensive standpoint, it's hard to guard Curry, Clay, and Katie at the same time, but figuring out ways to, you know, maybe maybe funnel the ball out of one of their hands and make somebody else beat you. We always talk about Golden State in their offense. You face Golden State, you've been effective against Golden State. Explain to us as fans of the game what they do to you defensively, because we know they're special shooters, but I think what they do defensively, that's what makes them a championship organization. Yeah, they're a great defensive team. It all starts with Draymond, obviously. His ability to guard one through five has affected this game. You know, they guard AD, he can switch out on Drew Holiday. 
And uh, they're similar to the Houston Rockets, where they essentially switch everything, one through five, on ball and off ball. So you have to be able to slip screens. You've got to be able to pick and choose and transition. And then it comes down to the one-on-one -on -one game, how to be effective in one-on-one -on -one game and draw crowds. And I think uh, AD's done that. He's drawing crowds. Uh, Draymond's funneling him to help. Iggy's helping. Looney's helping. Steph, Katie, they're all helping. So guys got to be able to step up and make shots. And I think going back home, Mirchich and some of those guys will, will be pretty effective down the stretch. I want to talk about Steph for a second because Steph coming back, after missing some playoff games with an injury, you, famously, the last time he did this, you were in that game. The game that he came back from, the famous I'm back game, 40 points including 17 in overtime, was against your Blazers. Again, I'm bringing up all the negative stuff. I apologize. What, it's okay. It happens. The, I mean, the, when you're I, – I know you're a competitor and you're a great player. It feels, as a viewer, that when he is dialed in like that and he's pulling up from the logo – there's almost a helplessness. Like, what do you do? Like the, I mean, you're, what, what do you, what's it like on the court when he is doing things that only he does? It's unfortunate you bring that up because I was guarding him in that game and he was struggling. He was struggling all night and he seen one go in and he you know, clapped his hands and he kind of like, you know, did a shimmy. And I was like, dang, he seen the ball go in. And it, that's the type of player he is. And I think he, there was an article released about his work ethic, what he did the night before the game. And his trainer were basically, his trainers were basically saying, you hit that first shot, it's going to be downhill from there. And you see, he checked in under four minutes, came off the pin down. First shot, catch and shoot is a three, bang, contested. So that's the type of player he is. He's able to hit contested shots, score off the bounce, play in pick and roll, play in isos. And his, his range is unlimited. So with that, with that being said, you have to press up tight and you can't guard any player with, with handle, you know, within arm's reach. We talked a lot on this show about because down the stretch the Warriors had so many issues with injuries and then Steph was out, then KD was out for a little bit. Who scares you more when you're playing against this team, <laughs> KD or Steph Curry? Me personally, I don't fear any man. Um, That's me neither. I don't fear any man. I just want to. You and I are like twins yeah. like that, CJ. We're like identical. But from a defensive standpoint, I think they both – pose different problems. Obviously, Katie's a seven-footer with handle. He's got the Dirk fadeaway now. You know, he's able to score essentially in every variety. But uh, with Steph's unlimited range and the way he moves without the ball, I think from an off-ball standpoint, he's harder to cover than Katie. Katie scores a lot of his baskets on pin downs, on yeah. isolation situations. They iso mid, uh, mid post and elbow. But guarding, guarding Steph having to chase him around I, is tough for me. How ex like that is, is that's possible? one of the underrated parts about when you have to or anybody but has to guard Steph right. is what it takes out of you when mm -hmm. you're expected to be a scorer. It's one thing if you're out there as just a defense, Andre Roberson. Like, and now he probably mm -hmm. would guard Durant, but his job is just guard the other team's best player, right? right. Your team needs you to score 20 plus if they're going to win most games, right? Like that, that's your expectation going in. Steph's movement without the basketball. Like the level of physical exhaustion it takes just to stay with him when they are running so many screens off ball when it, the fans are watching the ball and Steph is going. So what's it like as a player having to deal with that? It's tough, and their team passes the ball so well off the split post with Draymond and some of those guys. I guard Clay a lot of times, and I get switched on Steph at, at times. And with how much they move, how much they cut, everyone's a threat at all times. There's a lot of unselfishness with that team, and that's why they lead the, lead the league in assists every year because not only do they move, but they have arguably the best two shooters that ever play the game. So now you look at this Warriors team with Steph back, and they're as complete as they ever were. They struggled a little bit in the midseason. Then you compare them to a Rockets team who was so complete all regular season and now have shown a little bit of rust or a little bit of whatever you want to call it. Right. How, how do you compare those two? Who do you, who do you like a little bit more coming out of the West? Well, I mean, I've played against the Warriors so many times. I understand, you know, how seasoned they are. They, they're playoff bound every year. They're essentially in the finals every year, and they have that camaraderie and collectiveness, collectiveness and togetherness. But the Rockets are good. They pose a lot of problems. When James gets going, when CP gets going, they're able to get into the lane and kind of create for everybody else. But um, they, they got their hands full in this Utah Jazz series. I think Utah will give them a run for the money, but they, they'll probably get out. And... Uh, with the Warriors' experience and having played together for so long, I think the Warriors probably have the edge, but I think it'll be a very, very competitive yeah, I, series. I know personally you face the Warriors, so you're a little more familiar with them. Right. Houston's just now getting to that level when they got CP, PJ Tucker, and some others. What are the things that Houston, if we were looking at them, and if they were to ho hoist the trophy this year, what are the problems or the things that they would have to do to continue the success that they have with 65 games during the regular season? I think it's a defensive end. Offensively, the floor is so spread. They get out and run. James has mid-pick and rolls with the lob threat. And then he can also hit P.J. He can hit Trevor. There's a lot of guys who can knock down shots. But defensively, they got uh, um, 
<laughs> Mba Mute, how you say? They got his, they got him <laughs> back, and he's a really, really good defender. Allows them to switch everything. So you know, potentially in a finals matchup or a Western Conference uh, finals matchup, you know, with him, with him out there, that allows them to be a lot more, uh, more length and more ability to switch. Yeah, this is my first time meeting you. Now he's he's from Ohio, so I got I got love for you. Always did, but. Your ability to be able to communicate basketball. I'm talking, I've met a lot of Man. great players. My brother played in the NBA, coached in the NBA. A lot of guys know basketball, but they can't teach basketball. You ever thought about being a coach after you get done playing? I have my kids' camps every year, and it reminds me of, you know, for one, how I need to hold off on having kids. And, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to get people to do the things you want and, and say, but... I could definitely see myself maybe in a, in a front office position, but I don't want to. I don't want to travel like I did when I played. Right, but you love the game and I you love, love the, the X's and, and O's the, of it. And yeah. the point that you just made, I'm just sitting here. Listen, I'm a basketball nerd. Like this is the side of my family, my favorite thing that exists in the world is the NBA playoffs. Right. And hearing someone talk about the game and teach me things just from four feet away is. Remarkable. Like, hey, Cece's absolutely right. A lot of great athletes can obviously play at a super high level, but it's hard to verbalize what they're doing. I got one, one more Western Conference question before we move on. We talk about Rockets Warriors. Who's more frustrating to play against at individually? Draymond with the mugging and the flexing and the antics or Harden with the chicanery with the officials. I like, listen, I, the, 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 the Harden with almost a, in an intelligent way manipulating the rule book. Who's more frustrating to go up against? I like it. See, I like Draymond's game. Um, I like the way he plays. I like the energy he brings. And I like people talk trash. And, you know, we from Ohio, you understand what it's like. It, it gets you going. You're from like, Kansas City. They don't do that in Kansas City. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Chill out. You ain't know nothing about Shout Kansas City. Shout out to my guy Earl Watson. But, oh, yeah. yeah but, <laughs> I like it, so it, it doesn't really bother me. It brings the best out of me. I think that players that are distracted or bothered by it just you know, have to have thicker skin. But from a guarding standpoint, obviously with James, you can't touch him. And that makes the game hard, not being able to put your hands on him, not being able to you know, get that five-second count because he's always a threat to kind of swipe up and leads the NBA and, and fouls, on, fouls drawn on three-point attempts. So it's, it's really hard to guard him, but it's a nice challenge that you accept because he's one of the best players in the league. He's been runner-up MVP and probably will win it this year. I know you'll argue uh, LeBron, but I think that uh, with the success they had in the regular season, that he's probably going to get it this year. All right, CJ, stick around. We're going to have one other segment with you. We'll talk about why you don't want to have kids. That's going to be the bulk of that. I want to have kids. Sure. It's just not, yet. Just not, not yet. yet. It's not yet. Like kids, he doesn't want to travel, so <laughs> nobody tell him to go anywhere. Uh, we're going to talk LeBron James on the other side. First things first, right after this. I was an extinction-level event last night.